My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the Classical Classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classical Classroom. I'm Desha Clay, and I am here today with Matthew Durst, who is the artistic director of Ars Lyrica Houston, which is an ensemble that performs music from the 17th and 18th centuries. He is the first American to win major international prizes in both organ and harpsichord. He is professor of music at the University of Houston Moore School of Music, and he is a recording artist, which we'll talk about later. Matthew, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for letting us into your office today. This is our first off-site classical classroom. Very <laughs> cool. I think it's my first radio broadcast from the office as well. How about that? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and we're sitting here, and you're sitting at a harpsichord, which I'm going to have to get a photo of before we leave, because I I've never... Well, okay. I saw Tori Amos play one in concert once. But that was from really far away, so this is my first time to be next to a harpsichord. Are you sure that was really a harpsichord? Pretty sure. Huh, okay. Sounded hmm. like one. I know she plays one. Huh, um, But it's it's so small. It's like, what are the what Well, are this the one's actually quite here? long by harpsichord standards. It's okay. eight feet, six inches or so, but it, the box isn't very deep. Um, it's yeah. because this is an Italian instrument and modeled after uh, instruments from around 1700 um, in the middle of Italy in, in Florence. Okay. Um, so it's a Florentine prototype, um, so-called by its builder, uh, John Phillips in Berkeley. But it, it does what Italian instruments in the late Baroque uh, did. Um, mm-hmm. That is, it has just a couple of choirs of strings that both play at unison pitch. They're all brass throughout, which gives it quite a, a kind of aggressive, um, twangy sound. It's mm-hmm. like a big, loud guitar, basically. Yeah, I noticed that. Like, yeah. I used to play guitar, and I, was, I, I, I have a little recording that I'll post on our website of what it sounded like when you were tuning it. And it, it was just like yeah. just like tuning a guitar. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's played essentially the same way. You pluck the string. Yeah. They just do it via the mechanism of a key uh-huh. and a jack on a harpsichord, whereas with a guitar, you're doing it with your fingertips or your fingernails. So you said it was it was it came about in the 17th century. Is that right? Uh, the earliest harpsichords were really in the 16th century, okay. um, but the the heyday of the instrument was the 17th and the 18th century. Yeah. Okay. And and were there like sort of proto harpsichords were there there even like earlier instruments than this that that sort of uh organs and clavichords certainly yeah okay. they've been around a lot longer um the earliest organs were probably late middle ages really yeah wow i didn't know that yeah for some reason i've always thought harpsichord was the the first thing and if you go a long ways back there's even um what's called a hydraulis which is essentially a water organ and that goes all the way back to antiquity hydraulis yeah they, okay. Yeah, look it up. Explain um, it's, it's, that. It's simply powered by the, the by water. Um, you put water in a big tub, um, or a big uh, container, and the the pressure that it produces produces air. Uh-huh. If you connect it to a bellows and you feed the bellows air through um, some pipes, it's the same as blowing across you know an open bottle. Um, huh. You produce a noise. All huh. it takes is a, a cylinder and some air. Okay, I'm looking that up. Yeah. I don't believe that that exists. But <laughs> it did way back when. <laughs> So I'm kind of thinking of the timeline. Mm-hmm. And actually, I should ask if that's even appropriate. Like, I'm, I'm thinking about the harpsichord as an instrument that falls somewhere on the evolutionary timeline mm-hmm. t- th- leading up to today's piano as we know it. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that an appropriate way to think of yeah, it? Yeah, that's fair enough. It was okay. the most important predecessor, certainly, of the piano. Okay. Um, and there were a number of instruments in the 18th century that got transformed from one into the other, which is a fairly basic operation. You just simply replace the action of the plucking mechanism, um, mm-hmm. which consists of a s- slender little wooden jack that has a piece of bird quill attached to it. Um, you replace that with a little, small little hammer. Um, and presto, you've changed a harpsichord into a forte piano. Oh, hey. It won't <laughs> sound anything like a modern Steinway. Uh-huh. Um, it's a very different kind of animal, the 18th century but piano. But it's the same. But it's way, the same principle, basically. the action. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Who was, who was playing this? Like when it, when it uh, kind of 
came into prominence. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, was this something that you would find in people's homes? Yes. Okay. These like, are domestic instruments, par excellence, um, uh, particularly for aristocratic families. Yeah. Um, if you were the son or daughter of a of a monarch or a prince, mm-hmm. um, or even you know lesser nobility, um, odds are you had both music and dancing lessons in the 17th and 18th century, um, and you played either the violin, perhaps the uh, the recorder. Um, certainly the keyboard instruments, the harpsichord, Mm -hmm. um, were very popular. Um, The King of France always had a a harpsichord teacher on staff. Really? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. To teach members of the royal family um, and other nobles and their children who were at court. It was considered, you know, part of being a cultivated person during that time. Huh. And uh, who... Who was composing music for it? Virtually everybody who was active in the 17th or 18th centuries. Um, there are very few figures who really didn't write for the keyboard instruments during that time. Uh, people like Corelli, um, Vivaldi, not much. Um, a few other operatic composers um, who ignored it. But if you look at the major figures of the late Baroque, especially Bach, Handel, uh, Telemann, Rameau, Couperin, uh, they all wrote reams of keyboard music, much of it destined for a very busy amateur market in the 17th century, mm-hmm. or in the 18th century, that is to say, an emerging middle class that was also musical. Mm-hmm. Um, those people bought these volumes. There was a kind of culture of, of novelty about it. Um, every you know, 10 or 20 years, there would be a series of new publications from um, the, the composers who were on top of their game. Um, and you bought their latest sonatas or suites or concerti um, and learned them at home. So can you give us an example of one of the pieces that were really popular when, when uh, say, say ha- Handel, uh, when, when he was writing, like, what were... What yeah, were or perhaps playing? even more appropriate for an instrument like this is somebody like uh, Domenico Scarlatti, um, an Italian um, who wrote uh, 500 and some sonatas for an instrument like this. Really? Um, and they really benefit from the, the very um, peculiar pluck Um, sound of an Italian instrument. I mean, you can achieve percussive effects on it that are really not possible on a uh, on a modern piano that has heavy felt covered hammers. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a much more immediate and kind of uh, pingy sound. Yeah. 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 Something like this. Yeah. Notice how it just kind of leaps out of the instrument? Yeah. Um, It's a very immediate sound and one that dies away very quickly. Harpsichords don't have uh, things like sustain pedals Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of stuff. And so the sound can strike many a modern ear as rather dry. Um, When it's in a reverberant space, it sounds obviously a little bit more lush. But um, the basic character, um, it dies away fairly fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Making it a great domestic instrument. I love that sound. Mm -hmm. It's so light. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And the key dip on this instrument is extremely shallow. That's one of the challenges for pianists who come to it for the first time. Um, Because in comparison to a piano where you push the keys down uh, at least a centimeter or two, Mm -hmm. um, on this instrument it's a question of millimeters. Yeah. So it's a much less deep uh, kind of action. Yeah. Um, Obviously, people aren't playing harpsichord much today. I mean, I mean like, there aren't... It, uh, okay, I'll Depends say it's not on as where prevalent you ask that as piano. <laughs> <In Houston? laughs> Maybe I'm talking to the wrong guy In Houston, about perhaps <laughs> not, but um, go to Paris or Berlin or London or even Boston or San Francisco and you'll find a harpsichordist under every rock, it seems. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Is it really more prevalent elsewhere? Because, yeah. I mean, I think of it, you know, sort of as, as something that's... Uh, an instrument from a bygone day that people Well, it certainly play. is, um, but yeah. it depends really on the area of the world that you're talking about. Um, yeah. There are certain places, major European centers, um, both coasts in the case of the States, um, where the early music business took off in the last several decades of the, of the previous century, um, and there's a sizable critical mass of people who play, um, even amateurs um, who have instruments like this in their homes. But you say there was like kind of a resurgence of it? It was there, but it had... I'm not sure we can call it a resurgence because it was never, it was never on unsurged. the front burner in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of a new thing. Um, the harpsichord kind of got reinvented in the early 20th century um, by people who essentially took uh, pianos from the time, stripped out the action, and substituted um, a plucking mechanism in their place. 
Um, the result is you have these strange white elephants from the early 20th century that resemble really no historical instruments whatsoever. Um, they make a ton of noise, they're really hard to play, um, and they're kind of cranky. Um, those instruments have thankfully kind of disappeared from view these days, and most harpsichord builders have gone back to historical models um, of instruments, um, so that now the harpsichords that we play in public um, tend to resemble much more closely those yeah. of the 17th and 18th centuries, as opposed to some kind of uh, modern reinvention of what the instrument might sound like. Hmm. It's one of the more curious facts of this instrument that we went through in the early 20th century, especially this kind of strange phase um, of harpsichord rebuilding yeah. um, that, that were essentially pianos with harpsichord actions, oftentimes with things like aluminum plectra and steel strings that wow. just, I mean, the, the sound of them is not to be believed. Um, and uh, there's a couple of pieces that are in the repertoire, pe pieces like the, the Concerti by Manuel de Falla, that were written for those kinds of harpsichords. And so when you perform one of those pieces from the early 20th century in public these days, you usually end up using a historic instrument like the kind that's in front of me right now, mm. but putting a microphone inside it and pumping up its volume um, inside a concert hall in order to equal in some way the thick orchestra that those composers um, combined with these white elephants of instruments um, in the early 20th century. It's one of the strange anomalies of that repertoire. That's there is no instrument anymore that people play that really works for it. Wow, it's like the keytar. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, nobody composing for that now. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> the Frankencord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good name. I never, yeah, the I never heard that. So there are a lot more people than I apparently was aware of playing it, but it's still not as prevalent as, as the piano. Oh, certainly not, and it probably never will be. No. Yeah. Why is that? Is it just because, I mean, the piano is this big, unwieldy thing for the most part. I mean, it's, it's much heavier. It seems like the harpsichord would be much more yes, portable. Yes, and they're much harder to move as well, yeah. um, pianos, than, than harpsichords. I can lift this one by myself. It's not very heavy. Well, I know, and piano tuning is, is a crazy thing that has to be done. Yes, it is. You have to call a professional usually, whereas I tune this myself. Yeah, I just watched yeah. you do it in like five minutes. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were able to yeah, do it. Yeah, it's not so, hard once you know what you're doing. Given that, why did the piano for lack of a better word, win? Well, a number of reasons. Um, because the piano is capable of producing instantaneous dynamics, um, yeah. loud and soft, the, hence the name forte piano. Um, those words in Italian mean loud and soft. Um, that was Those were the words first used to describe the instrument in the 18th century because it was able to do um, loud and soft depending on how hard you hit the key. Yeah. Um, if you hit, the, hit it harder, you get a louder sound with a hammer mechanism. Whereas on this instrument, it doesn't really matter how hard I hit the key. It's going to be exactly the same pluck, mm -hmm. um, whether I'm using an extremely light touch or an extremely aggressive touch. The way to get a volume difference on a harpsichord is, is to add notes. So if I see a C major chord, for example, in a bass line that I might play, I might play these notes. <clears throat> Just to give myself uh, enough of the chord to do. If I want a little bit more sound, I add a few notes. If I want a lot more noise, I add more notes. And I get a lot more sound. But it's yeah. a question of, of making your fingers busy at the keyboard um, mm -hmm. and drawing the sound out of the instrument as opposed to having dynamic control through touch. Right. That is to say through the, the heaviness or the lightness right. with which How you play. how hard you yeah. bash the keys. Yeah. So that's one of the most important reasons why the piano really took off in the late 18th century, because okay. it was capable of those kinds of instantaneous dynamic shifts that composers really valued then. Yeah. By the 19th century, it had become a domestic instrument um, with a, a much larger middle class in Europe, particularly in Germany yeah. um, and in, in Great Britain. Um, and it became popular the world over. Uh, what, pianos as well uh, became mass produced in the 20th century, really in the 19th century. Um, and so they became affordable, whereas harpsichords never had that kind of factory approach to building. You, you huh. cannot go to a harpsichord store and buy one. <laughs> <laughs> they don't exist. 
Whereas Would there, you get a harpsichord kit and put it together? Well, you <laughs> might if you're exceptionally brave, but honestly, 80% of the people I know who've tried that have ended up calling a builder in a panic. <laughs> they say, oh, I can't do this. What do I do now? Yeah. And they end up, you know, having not so good inst- instruments as a result because they really don't understand how to properly construct one. Um, if you're a harpsichordist, you have to contract with the builder and commission an instrument. Oh, and sometimes wow. wait for it. Um, the better builders have waiting lists of several years. The builder of this instrument, his waiting list is currently about six years. So you have to be patient. Or you buy a used instrument or rent one for a while and get on with it. That's but um, it's not like getting a piano where you just go to your local piano store and play one until you uh-huh. find one that you like and plunk down your credit card and walk out the door. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can't do that with a harpsichord. Um, you have to find the right person to make one. So that as well contributed to the piano's popularity, the fact that it became a kind of industrial age staple, mm-hmm. um, that it was mass produced um, according to you know various schemes, whether you're talking about a grand or an upright. And they became fixtures in people's houses. Yeah. Um, harps- the harpsichord had faded enough by popularity um, by the 19th century that it was never mass produced. So it's never going to have the same popularity as the piano. Right. Yeah. Given all of that, like, mm-hmm. why are people still playing the harpsichord? I mean, obviously, I know that the, you know there are composers who are specifically writing for it. So, mm-hmm. to to have the most most authentic experience of their music, mm-hmm. I would assume you'd need to play on the instrument mm-hmm. that they compose for. But other than that, like, what is it that attracts people to this instrument now, and what are people doing with it now? For me, and I think for a lot of the rest of us who play the harpsichord, it's a love of the music from this age, um, from the late Renaissance really through the early classic periods Mm -hmm. in music history, roughly all of the 17th and the 18th century. Um, It's a real connection that one makes, um, whether on an emotional, technical, even spiritual level, um, with this repertoire that attracts you, I think, first and foremost to the instrument. Some people may be more interested in the kind of mechanistic side of it, in other words, how the instrument works, and get fascinated with just the machine itself. For me, that's always been a kind of secondary concern, and something that I had to learn how to deal with. When you're a harpsichordist, you have to learn how to tune, how to repair, how to make a quill, because they do break occasionally, repair strings, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, so a little bit of mechanical expertise yeah. is acquired along the way if you do this for a living. Yeah. Yeah. What are there people who are composing like contemporary classical music or other kinds? Yeah, of absolutely. Music In fact, I just played a piece the night before last. Really. Um, by Henri Dutilleux, a French composer who died just a couple of years ago. Chamber piece for harpsichord, oboe, string bass, and various percussion instruments. Cool. Fascinating piece. Great timbres. The sounds out of the harpsichord are not necessarily all that pretty, but the effects that he manages to create between the timbre of the harpsichord and that of the oboe, the string bass, the percussion instruments, are really quite mesmerizing. Um, I've played the piece a number of times now, and it's nice to come back to it. So yes, there is a significant contemporary repertoire um, growing all the time um, of pieces that involve the harpsichord, um, and oftentimes with surprising instruments. I've never done a piece that involved harpsichord with all these percussion instruments before. Yeah. But when you stop and think about it, this is a very <laughs> percussive sound. Yeah. So why not combine it with some other percussion instruments? Yeah. It works. Yeah. Well, um... I would love it if you would, before we, we close, I would love to hear you play a piece that you really like, um, just yeah. because I would love to. Sure, I can do that. Because I like to um, get free live performances of music. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a bit of a sonata from Alessandro Scarlatti, uh, an Italian composer from uh, the late 17th, early 18th century. Mostly wrote operas and oratorios and solo cantatas. But there's a volume of uh, perhaps a dozen or a few more keyboard pieces, and this is a movement from one of his sonatas um, called a partita alla Lombarda. In other words, a, a dance movement in the style of the, the Lombardy region okay. um, of Italy. Uh, this is mostly a two-part piece, basically a bass line and a treble line. And occasionally I'm playing a few thicker chords in the left hand. Uh, but this is a fairly common texture. Um, in much late Baroque music, um, just a top line and a bottom line, um, and you fill in in the middle when you're able to.
Very cool. Uh, so before we go, can you tell the listeners where they can find your music and Ars Lyrica's music? Yes, the be- easiest place to find Ars Lyrica's music is all over the web. Um, just Google us, A-R-S-L-Y-R-I-C-A Houston. Um, and our website is exactly that, arslyricahouston.org, um, on which you can find uh, links to all of our CDs, um, and they're all commercially available from Sun Illuminous, from Naxos. Um, I have a few solo discs on Centaur, or you can look me up on YouTube. Um, I'm the only Matthew D-I-R-S-T in the world, it seems, so I'm very easily Googleable. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks, Matthew. Mm-hmm. So that about does it for this episode, everyone. For more Classical Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom. Find us on SoundCloud, subscribe to us on iTunes, and listen on Stitcher Radio, but not all at the same time. Don't forget to rate and review us. Thanks to audio producer Todd Tickling the Ivories Holslander for making this show sound fabulous. To program director Sinjin Flynn for leading with a firm yet sock puppeted hand. To Matthew Durst for his charming conversation and snappy dressing. To me for saying words, and to you, dear listeners, for listening. We'll catch you next time.